by the Women's Center at Florida Junior College. Our guest today is Maggie Coon, founder of the Gray Panthers, dedicated to fighting age of discrimination. Thank you for being with us. I'm delighted to be here. Let me run a few terms by you. Golden agers, mature Americans, senior citizens, the aged, the elderly. Any of you about which do you prefer? Actually, we need new language, don't we, Pat? This is a new age, and the old terms are not appropriate. I like just old people, uh, and I like to think that we can liberate ourselves from any fear of old age or growing old or age itself and just enjoy those terms. And I'd like to say, you know, with trumpets, <laughs> we say young people, why not old people? Well, it but we that. use all these silly euphemisms. I, if we use the term senior citizens, as we've done so widely, I think we've not really, we've used the term without accepting the, res the awesome responsibility. Uh, built into that term seems to me uh, the, a very, very important public accountability to work full time, you know, 24 hours a day for the public interest, to change laws, uh, to, uh, to work for peace, uh, Let's to talk uh, protect about the environment. You see, those are terms that are, ought to be built into that, on, in, but instead we think of senior citizens as just playing and taking naps. Let's talk about your new, <laughs> well, that's very true, and those are among your goals. You've been, uh, the f you founded the group 13 years ago. Yes, yes. What are your goals at this stage? How have they changed? Well, <coughs> some we're still continuing to hold. We started in, in the summer of 1970 uh, to uh, lend our voices and our, and our warm life bodies to end the war in Vietnam. And we're still protesting the military budget. We're still fighting. We don't need MX, we need Amtrak. <laughs> That's what we need. Um, we're still working uh, for uh, uh, the elimination of age discrimination, ageism, gerontophobia. Uh, those are very Gerontophobia. Bad. Would you explain that for our gerontophobia audience? Gerontophobia is a sociological term that means fear of old people and of growing old. And it's an epidemic in America. But I like to think that, uh, that our being here and with, with a studio audience uh, and in a scholarly community, community college, uh, and with viewers who, who watch with uh, discretion, that um, we can make that sound great. What is there to look forward about getting old? Well, I'd like to think that we can um, eliminate uh, many of the oppressions that, that there are in the present situation. We can eliminate age discrimination if we really want it. Uh, we need to do mass education uh, to show that age is not a disaster, uh, but it's a triumph. And that the aging process isn't when you first find a gray hair, oh, gray hair, or porcelana, you know, for the brown <coughs> spots, another one. But the aging process, as our analysis points, begins with the moment of life and continues till rigor mortis. So that it's the one universalizing force that all of us share, everything, that lives, is born, matures, and dies. Someone once made the statement in a movie that nature is something we must learn to rise above. Now you feel that there is nothing wrong with wrinkles, uh, there's wrong. nothing wrong with gray hair. They're badges of distinction. On the other hand, <laughs> doesn't a that person... we worked hard for, really. Doesn't a person <laughs> gain, uh, I guess, uh, a good feeling, sel good self-image, if uh, he or she tries to remain youthful? What do you say about that? You mentioned all well, the products out there. The youthful state of, of living, uh, particularly in this society, is a, is a period of great anxiety. Uh, and people who have lived through youth and, and midlife and who have survived all the changes that we've seen uh, and triumphed uh, around and above them uh, have a certain historical perspective and a certain strength and authentic maturity that gives you strength 
and that I, I think constitutes a, a tremendously important <laughs> resource for our, for our country and for the world. Let's hear what our audience has to say. We have some questions out here. How about it? Okay, we'll be back to you. You do not approve of facelifts. You don't approve of. Uh, well, they're very risky, you know. There's uh, and they often uh, don't really last. Uh, but why not enjoy with our wrinkles? And I'm not saying not to look as well as one can, uh, to look attractive and and, uh, and dress and conduct oneself in a becoming, tasteful way. Uh, I'm not against that. I think that's terribly important, right up to rigor mortis. But to, to deny our age, to lie about it, uh, to take all these elaborate precautions to hide it, seems to me to be in bondage rather than liberated. You founded the Grey Panthers after you yourself had been forced to, to retire. You yes. were 65 at yes, the time. Yes, yes, yes. And that's when it all started. There are probably two ways to look at mandatory retirement. On the one hand, you hear, well, why should somebody have to retire if he's still good at his job, yeah, she's still yeah, good at her yeah. job? On the other hand, younger people may say, there are a lot of us. You gave birth to an awful lot of children back then, and now none of us can find jobs. It's time for you to step aside. What do you say to that? I say that, that the fact that it exists at all is a commentary on an economic system because the experience and the skills of people ought not to be thrown away. Uh, I like to do uh, <coughs> what Polaroid has done, to share from older workers' experiences and, and their historical perspective uh, what one knows in one's old age with the young. Uh, that gives life continuity. Uh, the role of the mentor and the mentee provide for assurance on the job, and I think that if we kept the old and the young together in the workplace, that the workplace would be more human, and that the young would feel less threatened, and that the old would have a place. I believe we have a question out here. Heidi, you said earlier that uh, we could do away with age discrimination if yeah. we tried, and I'd like to know how you think we can do that. It's a uh, lot more difficult done than said. Well, it's, it is very blithe and easy to say, but people are defined in our profit-centered society by chronological age. Uh, we uh, are also defined by what we do. You know, the first thing you ask a stranger is, what do you do? And if you don't do anything, quote, unquote, if you're just a housewife or if I'm retired, then you are automatically a non-person, a less worthy, less, less important to society. And I think we've, we've both uh, discriminated against young people, children, and old people in a society that values profits and high productivity. And people who are deemed not to be fully productive are therefore uh, less valued uh, and, and discriminated against. Uh, I think it's, it's a question of, of education to eliminate it. Uh, it's a question of continuing education, which, of course, this, this great college is doing, providing for lifelong learning, so that people are, are updated in their skills. Uh, they, they have perception of the changing world around them. But beyond that, which is, which is pretty much internal and eternal, <laughs> because it has to continue, uh, I think that there has to be some structural change We've got to change the, the job scene. We've got to restructure work. We've got to make a lot of space for flex time and part-time work. Uh, we've got to uh, make uh, it quite uh, unnecessary for people to step aside. The, the question of working or retiring uh, should be a matter of choice, an option. Maggie, there are only so many jobs out there, especially now with the economy the way it is, and there are more and more people, particularly in the, in the baby boom generation. Where are the jobs going to come? Well, you see, we've, we've, we've robotized work, and we're, not, we're using machines where, where people were once used. And I think we've got to look at the technology that we've got and see what is really human about it, what affirms life, what relieves people from dangerous uh, drudgery, so to speak. 
uh, but it has to be kept in, in within a reasonable balance. And I'm not convinced that they're not jobs. There is all kinds of work to be done, but we don't have the public will to pay for those jobs. So you're talking about a change on, on the government level, a I'm redistribution. I'm at the government level from the feds down. Reagan has to go. He really has to. What do you think about the that president's administration? That shows my bias. What do you, wh how do you well, feel Well, I think about the, the, the president's administration has done extraordinarily well for people who are, who are rich. Uh, it's, it's, they've flourished. And the large multinational co conglomerates have flourished uh, with Reaganomics. But it has decimated the middle class, and it's made many middle class women, particularly, uh, instantly poor. So it has, it has class divided our society more rigidly than it was before. Maggie, if you were president, what, what's the first thing you'd do to change this? Well, I would cut back on the defense budget. Uh, one point, a trillion point two dollars to blow ourselves to bits, to, to, to render our whole world insecure, seems to me to be utterly useless and an awful waste of, of taxpayers' money. I would cut back. And then there would be universal health. We would have health service for everyone. Health is a basic right, the way they do in China and Great Britain and Canada, uh, a public health program that benefits all. We have a question over here. Maggie, you said that you felt education was the answer for a lot of the problems that yeah. we're having. In the past 10 years, there's been an increase in programs uh, to learn about aging and yeah, speakers yeah. out in the community. Have you seen any evidence as you've traveled around that we are beginning to change our attitudes about growing older? I have seen some very remarkable changes uh, in self-image and, and the value of one's self and experience. And the fact that, that uh, the studio audience uh, with the large numbers of people in, in, in late life here, uh, very much a part of public affairs, very much a part of this new age, I think all of that has been uh, in large measure attributable to the new uh, self-worth and esteem that comes to people when, when there are uh, knowledgeable, when they are knowledgeable about the world around them. And moving out of their narrow self-image and self-interest to a larger perception of, of the public interest, what is in the larger public good. And when you reach out, as, as one does in, in continuing education, uh, to, to learners of different ages, we immediately do away with the rigid age segregation that we've got. I wonder what it is going to be like for members of the baby boom generation, as I'm a member, when we get to be senior citizens, given the differences uh, of this generation. Uh, well, I think, what you're, do you I think you're going to be very different. And I like to think that we are paying uh, our tribute to you and that we're doing all that we can to guarantee that the, that the world will be when you are. Uh, that we won't uh, nuclear bomb ourselves into oblivion. But we'll have a lot more power, won't we? But you will have more power. Imagine. There will be, uh, for instance, more uh, educated people. There are relatively few of my generation, I'll be eight, 78 in August, uh, have had college education. Uh, probably uh, less than 12 percent, I believe, have finished high school in my peer group. But your peer group, uh, there has been universal education. Uh, all would have had high school, and many would have had college. Com community colleges would be well established, and many, many people, millions, would have had access to the courses and the knowledge available there. And I think that be, uh, just as public health measures have triumphed uh, in the past to eradicate scourges and epidemics that killed off a lot of people in the past, that hopefully we're, we're continuing to, to improve our health. We're, we're taking more concern about our own health so that we, we protect ourselves from, the, uh, from poor uh, and living habits and from diseases that we should avoid. And of course, the status of women has changed greatly in the past Enormously generation, too. Enormously changed. So that will have an impact. 
the, uh, the, the liberation of women is a, and men, I think, is very much a part of this new age. I believe we have a question. We'll get to you, sir, in a second. Maggie, I'm the same age as Ronald Reagan. Uh -huh. And if I'd known that old age was going to be this nice, I'd have gotten older sooner. If I'd have known that retirement was going to be this nice, I'd have quit work You'd sooner. Retire. I don't know what I would have lived on. My yeah. Social Security is around $1,039. He went into office, and I said, buddy boy, what you say you're going to do to the United States sounds real good, but a lot of politicians sound real good. Yeah. I went on his program for my household. Now, I've got Tip O'Neill living with me when it comes to cutting budgets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Tip and I cut our master charge and we cut our visa. We're living better now than we've ever loved. I want to know from you, who are you looking at for Ron to replace Ron or the kind of program that he has put forth? I got on my first new suit since I, a Republican you, came Do out. you attribute that to Ronnie? Yeah, because what he has taught me what to do, uh, going down the line with him, I have cut things that are not absolutely impulse buying, doing the things that I want to do instead of the things that are necessary to do, and which the American people are going to have to do. I work with quite a number of senior citizens. And the things that we're giving a lot of us are not necessary. We are not used to it. We don't, ha don't know how to handle it. I was taught as a child to make my own clothing. When I get a store-bought dress, I wear it today. <laughs> but I, uh, I attribute to a grown person coming in on an age that I am the same age, and I'm <coughs> retired, and if I step out of line too far, if anybody else steps out of line too far, they're going to get hurt. Well, let's see what Maggie has to say about it. That they don't know how to <coughs> Let me say to you, I think that Ronnie, just because he is your age, he doesn't necessarily identify with old people. In fact, he, he, was, he would have liked to have bankrupt or declare, he did indeed declare the, the, the Social Security system that, that maintains uh, the only income that 80% of our peers have. He would have cut that out. And if there hadn't been a great hue and cry, uh, it would have, there would have been much more uh, eroded uh, benefit uh, from the system than, than there had been. So I don't, I really don't uh, see that he has been our benefactor. I think we have, we, have, uh, we have kept alive, and you're fortunate because you've had, uh, you've had health, for one thing, uh, rel relatively good health, so that you can make your clothes. Uh, you're able to do it. You have good eyesight to do it. Uh, you, you look as though you're well fed. Uh, yeah, I'm a good cook. You're a good cook. Well, now, Ronnie didn't teach you to cook. Those were no, things that those were. Those are the. My I have $200 in a little box. Mm -hmm. I catch Gordon in there with that <laughs> legitimate reason to talk about well, it. Well, I'm glad. I, I hope that, uh, that, that he continues to, to keep you in good health because in many places, uh, his, his, his reign, quote unquote, has been uh, a, a disaster. I did hear what you said. I heard what he said on Social Security. I heard it differently. I heard what a lot of people have said about Social Security. Had they been given the money, they would have invested it. They're not telling the truth because they didn't have enough taken out to invest. Well, many Nobody people would have didn't, accepted it. But many people who were marginal, and most of the, most of the marginal workers, uh, the majority of them have been women who have not worked long enough to, to build large uh, benefits for themselves in the Social Security system are, are on minimal Social Security supplemented with SSI, uh, so that I think that that was a lifeline that was in jeopardy because he felt that, that we could manage our old age ourselves. We have, uh, we had a, a gentleman over here waiting uh, for a question. We have another one over there, sir. Uh, Kuhn, in the past 25 years, the United States government has given away to foreign nations $2.4 trillion. Yes. That is more than twice our national deficit. Uh, how do you feel about uh, diminishing or eliminating foreign aid? Well, <coughs> I think uh, in the last, uh, in, in recent administrations, foreign aid has always been linked uh, with military aid. 
uh, and, and there's a tie-in to, uh, to a certain kind of security uh, that goes with military aid for, for overseas investments of American multinationals. Uh, I think that foreign aid, of uh, which uh, came uh, in uh, in point four programs, uh, where uh, and and foreign aid that was that was uh, built uh, into systems to rescue uh, impoverished countries and impoverished people from famine and uh, pestilence and starvation. I think that uh, that human beings, who who are really human if we haven't departed entirely from our humanity, uh, that we as a nation uh, have that obligation. Uh, I, I resent the fact that so much of it has been tied uh, to, uh, to military expansion uh, and, and has not been a charitable, <laughs> quote unquote, uh, as, as it was alleged to be. Uh, this is true of our aid to Latin America and other places. We have another question back there. Maggie, would you tell us about your legislative priorities? Our legislative priority at the present time uh, is uh, a new thrust uh, for health care. Uh, the health care system is, uh, is really sickness care. It's extraordinarily expensive and highly technological. And um, uh, the, the possibilities of, of humanizing it uh, and, and helping us, the consumers of those health services, to be more knowledgeable of our bodies, uh, to be more aggressive in, in seeking reforms. Um, we, we are also very much concerned about uh, the enormous profits that are realized in the present health care system. I've been reading uh, the, uh, the Journal of, uh, of Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, and the, uh, the editor of, of that very distinguished uh, periodical uh, has warned uh, American doctors and American uh, people of what health for profit is going to do to us. There are enormous hospital chains, Humana, Humana and others, that are, making, uh, that are doing very efficient medicine, quote unquote. Uh, but, uh, but not really delivering the kind of health care. And again, uh, as Ronnie has done, divided the country sharply between the rich and the poor, and the people who cannot afford uh, expensive surgery and who cannot afford uh, the, the, the fees will be turned away from the clinics of those, as they are now, from, from the uh, health for profit uh, establishments, and left to die. Or, or, or cared for uh, in, uh, after waiting long lines uh, in, in, the, uh, in the clinics of the few public nonprofit hospitals that are left. We have a question over here. Ma'am? Yeah, thank you. Yes. One of the things that we're told continually is the reason we have age discrimination is the wide divorce between all the ages of people. Young and older people just put in a camp. Yes. Tell some ways in which people can live within the community and be more a part of it, some inventive styles of living. Well, I think continuing education is one of the ways in which the people of different ages get together in the classroom. Uh, the continuing education classroom is really a kind of extended family, a family of choice. But the thing that the Great Panthers have been working on uh, and is now in a, in a, in a special uh, nonprofit group of its own, is the uh, Shared Living Resource Center. Uh, people who have houses <coughs> are sharing their space with people who need space. And in many places, I'm sure this is true in Jacksonville, there are big old houses where lonely one or two old people live because they've lived in those houses when their families were growing and large and they live in, their fa in those houses in old age and many of the survivors in those houses are, are s women who are widowed and lonely and afraid and in the shared housing resource center we match people and it's there's been an exciting uh, trend in this direction uh, Congressman Royville and Pat Schroeder from Denver are introducing legislation, the Shared Housing Act of 1987, uh, 
three uh, it, it has had first readings in the House. Uh, we have been wor working in several communities to change the zoning laws so that people who are not kin, redefining the family, so that people who live as a family but yet who have no kinship bonds can live together without being hassled by uh, zoning inspectors or Mag the neighbors. Maggie, you have been critical of what you call adult playpens, that is the old age uh, yes, they projects. Are. They're they're are they glorified playfulness. Are they to keep old people in Safe or and out of the way. Or to keep young people out? Both. And, and uh, if you visited any of the intentional communities, uh, Leisure World or Sun City, or some of the large complexes in, in Florida, there are very large signs saying no children allowed. And how inhuman it is. Don't some old people want to be away from children? Well. Uh, this, this, I think, is another f a fact of, of ageism. Uh, we, uh, we, we deny our responsibility to those who come after us. Uh, and I think this is being a very irresponsible senior, because we, if we are the elders of the tribe, then we're concerned about the tribe, the youngest uh, and, and the most vulnerable should be protected and loved and cherished by us. Well, what do you say to people who will say, Maggie, I'm tired, I'm old, I raised my family, I just want to be left alone? Well, then alone. I'd say to you, well, you're going to be <coughs> ultimately very lonely. And if you like being lonely, <laughs> and if you like <coughs> to be inhuman, uh, apart from humankind, uh, you are denying uh, your creator, because we were, we were created as social beings fulfilled in company of others. But do you get that sort of response I when do, you go out? I do, and I think people have been conditioned to be very self-centered and self-seeking and selfish. I think that's, a, that's an expression of selfishness. It's not of caring and love. But, <laughs> but my dear, when, you, when you've institutionalized people in nursing homes, and, and you know there are more people in nursing homes than in hospitals today, about five or six percent. But when they are institutionalized, you, you change the atmosphere of the place. When a baby comes, the hands reach out. I wish we had more time to talk about this. I do want to thank you very much for being with us. I want to thank our audience. You've been a great audience. I'm Pat Broderick. Thank you for joining us.